So uh, our talk today is uh, entitled Mission Accomplished. Kubernetes is not a monorepo, now our work begins. Uh, thank you for attending on one of the last slots today. Uh, I am Justin Santa Barbara. I have been contributing to Kubernetes for, I guess, longer than I care to admit now. Um, I've done a lot of work on the initially on the AWS cloud provider. I kicked off the KOps project a number of years ago, and I've been at Google now for a number of years trying to help uh, people with their adoption of Kubernetes. Uh, hi, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Cyprian. Uh, I'm a and sorry, I'm a IABT engineer at Microsoft these days. I am also helping companies uh, migrate to Kubernetes. In, and in my spare time, I'm a maintainer and contributor to various cloud native projects. So, okay. okay so, uh, this is what we're going to be covering today. Uh, broadly, why did we split up the monorepo? Why did we go from one big uh, Git repository source of truth into the many repositories that we have today? Um, when we did that, did we lose things or was it all just, just upside? And spoiler, uh, the things that we did lose, how can we get those things back? That's what we're going to be covering today. Okay. Uh, in the beginning, there was one big Kubernetes repo, so everything in one place. Uh, all components were versioned together, like there was no cloud provider or other things. Uh, and there was end-to-end -end testing, um, multiple clouds on every PR. And that was actually pretty good. Um, it was the right architecture for the time. It was actually very easy to make big uh, cross-cutting changes across multiple layers. You could have one PR that could change you know, the API, it could change the Kube API server, the controller manager, kubectl could change the scripts that installed Kubernetes. You could do that all in one PR and everything would just sort of go together. It was a, a very productive way to move quickly. Um, and we had good test coverage as well. You know, we had test coverage that would test on AWS and GCP. We had some other tests on other cloud providers that, um, you know, were, were a little bit more complicated, but those, the AWS and GCP tests were kicked off on every single PR. So every time you made any change to Kubernetes, even if you just changed the docs, you know, we would make sure that you hadn't broken AWS and you hadn't broken GCP. Um, and we were able to test all those, all that cloud provider functionality, all the functionality in Kubernetes on every single PR. So it was a good, productive place where we were. So, it, it was pretty good, but why did we stop doing this? Uh, there were a lot of technical issues, uh, many related to GitHub. There were tons of notifications, so people could not keep up with them. Uh, there was a huge volume of comments, and it even broke uh, GitHub loading PRs. Um, and the worst and most frustrating, you couldn't merge PRs. Like it could take two, three days to merge your PR because there was a huge queue right before each release. So, and this was when bulk merge was introduced, but still was not perfect. We also had a bunch of what I would call people issues. So. It was hard to know in this growing community of, of people who needed to see each PR and, and who didn't need to see each PR and make sure that like the right people had, had approved the PRs. Um, we introduced owner's files um, to try to route things more intelligently to the right people. Uh, but it ended up that basically we would bottleneck on a few key people. Um, uh, it, it was very hard as these people, as we have more and more people, to get everyone onto the, at the time, quarterly release schedule and get everyone synchronized. And that just became harder and harder as, you know, we added more cloud providers and generally more functionality. So a lot of what I would call people issues as well. Okay. Um, why did we stop doing this? It enabled us to do a lot of architectural improvements. Uh, this way, um, things are not depending that much of uh, a single person can be split up of the Kubernetes repo. Um, and also, 
projects that use various pieces of Kubernetes could just source those components instead of just having a big dependency of Kubernetes and conflict with uh, other dependencies that don't uh, upgrade at the same time. And, and fundamentally, you know, those uh, technical people and architectural reasons were, were solid, but really there was an underlying reason. That was sort of a, a philosophical, philosophical reason about how we wanted to be as a project. We did not want to be a monorepo where we were like the centralized gatekeepers for, you know, this is cloud native and this is not cloud native. And, you know, you're in, you're out, you're hot, you're not. We didn't want to be that. We wanted to have this industry. We wanted to have a large number of tools uh, where anyone could could come and collaborate and put their ideas in, and you know that that is what effectively became the cloud native ecosystem that we have today. Um, and we had a bunch of technical strategies that we used to enable this idea. So, basically, the core idea was to make sure that you you did not have to contribute to KK. So you could get anything done without having to contribute into KK. Uh, KK being Kubernetes. Kubernetes. Uh, that you know, is largely the case today, but at the time, in the early days, it was not. And so things like CRDs enable you to add types without having to extend the API server. That was not always the case. Things like webhooks enable you to change the behavior of any, of any type. Um, we added APIs where there were not extension points before for things like CRI, CNI, CSI. So, so that is, you know, some of the tactics that we used to get to this point. Uh, with the release of Kubernetes 127, uh, even cloud providers are out of the main tree. Uh, this is a huge success. Um, this was the last to go, so now we have broken up the monorepo. We have CSI, CRI, CNI, cloud providers, and probably a few other things. Uh, all are developed in different GitHub repos. Uh, and by the people that are actually interested in those topics um, and maintaining them. And so here, is, uh, here are some vanity uh, stats that sort of reflect where we are. Um, so in, in the Kubernetes organization, there are 77 repositories. Uh, in the Kubernetes SIGs organization, there are 161 repositories. Uh, there are 240 uh, GitHub projects tagged with Kubernetes controller, so that's a good sort of proxy for operators. There are 27,000 plus uh, tagged with Kubernetes, and there are like more than 47,000 repositories that consume client Go. So if you think about where we were, where all that, all that development was happening in that Kubernetes, that second entry in that left-hand column, to so now where we have 48,000 repositories on GitHub, you know, this is a this is a huge success in terms of de-bottlenecking ourselves and enabling uh, activity to happen outside of just that second line there. As Justin was saying, innovation can now happen outside of KK, uh, and we have now Carpenter, tons of operators. Uh, we have worked separately from KK on IPv6 for some time. Uh, even Docker was removed and everything kept going with uh, container D and cryo. Well, now we have Docker back also. Um, and it's much easier to contribute to individual CSI, CNI and cloud provider projects. Uh, the IPv6 uh, story was quite interesting. Technically, it was supported uh, by Kubernetes since I think version 1.4, but it only worked in specific uh, setups uh, without any cloud provider support. Um, with some work being done on dual stack like two or three years ago, um, many of uh, the blockers were fixed uh, and inconsistencies uh, and enabled uh, external cloud providers to do their own thing around IPv6. Mm. Also, the release of uh, IPv6 prefixes by the major cloud providers uh, helped us add it to cloud provider AWS, and now we're working on uh, GC, for example. And it's much, much easier because you just have to talk with uh, a bunch of people, 
from AWS or Google and that's it. If they say it's okay, you don't have to consult any other person. And of course, it is not all roses, though. There are some thorns here. And so what have we lost? Um, well, I think the big thing that we've lost is that the experience for Kubernetes administrators, the people whose job it is to take those 47,000 pieces and put them back together, uh, that experience is worse than when it was pre-assembled for them and tested for them in the KK repo. Um, at least in Kubernetes, Kubernetes, we don't actually test these things together anymore. You have no guarantees and there's no one putting these things together for you. Um, so a lot of people will go and you're almost compelled to rely on a, dist on a distribution now, whether that's a commercial distribution like GKE or EKS or AKS or whoever it is, or an open source distribution like KOps, you're, you're very much compelled to, or it is much easier if you, you have to get your testing from somewhere else. Um, and the problem of doing this yourself is now so much harder, right? There are all these components now which didn't used to exist and they're all developed independently on different schedules by groups that may or may not actually talk to each other that, that much. And it is a harder problem than it was before. It was, it was never easy and now it's even like a, a bigger problem than it ever was. And that complexity is only magnified when you have upgrades and, and gradual upgrades. Uh, and, and you have to worry about all these different release schedules and you are, you are now responsible for putting those things all back together. So we have definitely lost something. Okay, should we put uh, everything back together for testing uh, to make it resemble more to a monorepo? Uh, is this practical at this moment? Uh, choosing version is very difficult and uh, the complexity becomes exponential with uh, subsets of features and versions for each component. Keops does this, uh, but so do other distros. Um, so does every project that wants to run E2E tests. But all of us do it separately, uh, duplicating various efforts, and we do it better or worse. Uh, I'm going to talk through a little uh, sort of case study of one of the problems that, that arose here, which was um, the cloud provider for GCP. Uh, we had a bug that, that came up on the KOps E to E testing where uh, a particular combination was failing. The combination was uh, KOps and uh, external, the external version of the cloud provider GCP uh, in a particular networking mode. Uh, it's called IP alias networking mode. And that combination was failing E to E tests. And we didn't really know why. Uh, and the details aren't that important, but effectively what we, the manifest that we were using to install the cloud provider GCP, there's a little bit of that manifest over there on the right, right, yeah, uh, was a little bit different from the manifest in the cloud provider GCP repo. And it actually turned out that uh, both sides were broken. Uh, the manifest uh, we were using was uh, exercising functionality that was different from uh, the, the version, from the functionality that they were testing in cloud provider GCP, uh, that functionality was actually broken on the GCP side. Uh, arguably, they were testing the wrong functionality there, but you know there were things broken on both sides. And the the problem is that uh, we catch these things only after like cloud provider GCP has been released. Typically, you know, it's Kubernetes has been released. The cloud provider GCP is is then does their release and so on. This is really really late in the day to be catching these sorts of problems. Um, we would like to catch them much much earlier. And so what we're working with uh, specifically for cloud provider GCP uh, and KOps, but we're going to be doing effectively on all the, all, all the, all the components, um, and we would hope that other distributions do the same, is this idea of sort of continuous testing with production manifests. So uh, cloud provider, we're adding tests to cloud provider GCP. We've added tests to cloud provider GCP um, so that they continuously test with uh, KOps and their uh, their manifest and they publish that manifest that they intend for us to consume. Uh, KOps will consume that manifest that they are continuously testing with, so we have some test coverage there. Uh, other tooling, cluster API, uh, kubeadm, whatever it may be, they can also do the same thing. They can 
obviously there you can consume the tested manifest that Cl Cloud Provider GCP is now uh, publishing, which is great and better than they are today. Uh, and if they also want to, they can add additional testing to Cloud Provider GCP so that Cloud Provider GCP can test with more sort of production environments and fewer of its own test scenarios. Okay, uh, we are asking components to publish working manifests, not just container images. Uh, if all the Kubernetes components start testing their manifest in fully assembled distributions, KOps and others, uh, then all the distributions can consume these manifests for testing purposes at least. Uh, we should catch all single source bugs in this way, uh, where bugs are introduced by the component. Uh, combination bugs will be caught by the distros and are hopefully much rarer. Um, yeah. Absolutely, yeah. So, like the, a single source bug being a bug that's introduced in Cloud Provider GCP should now be caught basically when they introduce that PR. They, that, the cloud provider GCP PR will, will run uh, against GCP with production tooling with KOps at some relatively recent version of KOps. Getting back to where we were back in the days where everything was in KK, that, that test will run against real GCP infrastructure with real production scripting. And so hopefully if it's a, the single source versus multiple source, a multiple single, so, ah, single source versus combination is sort of subtle, but the idea is if, if it's a bug that is specific to cloud provider GCP, uh, that should hopefully get caught there. Uh, there are bugs that happen only when two things go wrong at once, as it were. So, uh, you know, you have uh, Linkerd in combination with some Cilium, uh, uh, some Cilium configuration. Uh, those sorts of things where they both need to happen, that'll only get caught later on uh, by the distributions, but those are much rarer than the single source uh, bugs. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, components or projects should think about how distro do upgrades or how their customers do the upgrades. Uh, because if you release manifests, you have to take into consideration uh, immutability. There are various fields that you cannot change with an upgrade, like selectors uh, or if you change the namespace, you might end up with awkward, awkward things. Um, there's disruption. Um, people don't really like uh, to apply a new manifest and then uh, their cluster be broken because you had to run some special command or something uh, that was, you know, you cannot express via the manifest. So it's not quite good. Uh, and uh, the skew, because uh, the components don't necessarily think of their manifest as production ready, uh, they tend to use uh, simple versions of these manifests um, that the distributions have to enrich with uh, various things like anti-affinity or, you know, and in time, this, uh, this gets to a certain version skew compared to, uh, for distribution compared to what uh, the components uh, release. Um, and in time, it's hard to keep track of all these smaller or bigger changes uh, around uh, the manifest. Uh, and besides all these, uh, smaller problems. Uh, there are non-Kubernetes objects that uh, cannot be expressed in manifests, like uh, IAM policies, uh, firewall rules, TLS certificates, uh, which should be somehow specified in a way that uh, the distribution can keep track of them and can set it up so that uh, the components works as expected. Like, not just have some, well, a bunch of documents somewhere they say, hey, in this version, you have to set up this, this, and this. Uh, in time, they get lost. 
Yeah, I, I, the dream on, on this uh, second one there is that uh, we'd be able to install a CNI, for example, that we'd never seen before in, in a distribution tool. Uh, that the CNI would express, you know, the firewall ports that needed to be opened. Um, so it's not a it's not a huge problem in that there's a fairly small universe today. Uh, this is, you know, surmountable in that we can sort of hard code and we know, oh, you know, Cilium needs this particular port to be opened. Um, but just when we're thinking about like the next 100x growth, how are we going to like enable these things to move for like to move forwards and and grow another 100x as it were. Um, so these are the things we're going to be working on. They aren't, they aren't insurmountable. Uh, another, another problem is that we don't actually have a great standard today um, for what a manifest should look like if it isn't static. And a lot of these manifests are not static. So a lot of the components uh, need some per cluster information. Uh, so a lot of them need the cluster name uh, or they need the cluster ciders, some of the ciders, service ciders, pod cider. Um, and that information there's no there's no like standard today for how we are going to plumb that through uh, once again I suspect we'll make do on a one by one you know one by one interaction basis ge try to generalize those sorts of things um, but these are some of the challenges we're going to be working through with the components as just as distros uh, another one is uh, a lot of the components have what I would what I classify as variants so they have whole feature sets that are enabled or disabled in, in different combinations. And a, a canonical example is you can enable or disable encryption uh, in Cilium, for example. Uh, that's okay if you have a small number of those features, but when you have a large number of features, you're potentially talking about you know, two to the N uh, manifests that we're now asking them to publish. So I think there's a interesting discussion there about how the components want to publish the feature sets that they want to be consumed. Um, we Obviously, we can publish multiple manifests if that number of feature sets is small enough. Um, but if they genuinely believe they want to publish two to the n and n is big enough, that is going to break down pretty fast. OK, what about the Helm charts? It's very popular these days. Um, is this the answer? Uh, we think that not quite. It's close, but it's not perfect. Helm charts by default allow a large number of setting combinations. Uh, because of that, uh, you may end up with uh, a generated manifest that is not quite what uh, the component expected when Helm chart was created or what they test with. There's no standards for the parameters uh, structure, like the name of uh, all of them. So you may have to read all of those or they will differ for similar components. Um, and this is kind of like an API that uh, has to remain stable across upgrades of the Helm charts. Okay. So, um, our proposal is this. We ask uh, the components to publish manifests uh, in a way that they should be used in production. Um, and we ask of them to test with these manifests, ideally with production tooling. Doesn't matter which production tooling, but not use internal things that they cannot be reproduced by other people uh, easily. And in return for that, uh, this is the sort of, we ask and we promise uh, contract that we are working with uh, components on. Uh, we, KOPS and hopefully other distributions will join us in this, will help those components to test their manifests with production tooling like KOPS. So we'll, you know, work with, with the components to add those E to E tests. Um, we'd like for it to be KOPS, but it's, we'd like for it to be KOPS and Cluster API and KubeADM and, and a, a broad ecosystem of production tooling. What matters is that the manifests are tested in ways that are the same as are going to be run in production. 
And in return, we won't uh, you know, arbitrarily patch your manifest. So the manifest that you publish will be the one that goes into, into production. Um, if we have to m change it in some way, we, we will at least talk to you. Um, in other, and that, this is sort of, you know, this is not surprising, but this is somehow different from where we have landed uh, recently, where people aren't even aware of the fact that these manifests that are actually running in production are not the same things as the projects themselves are publishing and testing. And, and in short, so there's, you know, we've come a long way. Uh, we are very close. I think we have a way to achieve some of the things that we may have lost when we broke the monorepo up. Um, it's not the most technically challenging work, I think, at this point. Uh, there are definitely some technical challenges, as we've talked about. But it's as much organizational and making sure that we go through and, and set up those testing jobs and make sure that the pipelines work so that we're consuming the same manifest that, that the components think we're consuming. And we believe that if we do this, that we actually are now going to be able to get back to that uh, reliable and easy Kubernetes experience, while at the same time supporting this grand ecosystem that, that we have deliberately created um, and get back to where we were. And with that, I think we'll draw our talk to a close. If there are any questions, uh, we, can, we can take them. Um, and there is a QR code if you would like to leave feedback on this session. Um, I don't know if we have any mics, but it's a small room, so you can probably just shout if you have any questions. Thank you. At the back there, question? I have a question because I think that Kubernetes is the biggest go. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I have a question because as far as I know, Kubernetes is the biggest go uh, like open source repository. And I have a question, did you encounter any problems regarding, uh, for example, Go modules or, you know, sharing code between, between the repositories and how you were tackling it? Have you le left any feedback to the Go team, et cetera? Basically, your, your yeah, <laughs> thank you. Yes, uh, it's, it's a great question. Um, there has, so the, there's definitely been a lot of back and forth with the Go team about uh, how Go modules work, how we should structure things. Uh, anyone that has seen the staging uh, subdirectory knows that the Go team, we're not, you know, we're not the canonical example of how you should write well-structured Go. Um, a lot of it has evolved over the years, and as you say, it's because we have been the, one of the biggest Go projects in pushing the boundaries. Uh, that, that communication channel is open, I think, is healthier than ever. Um, people like Tim Hawken, for example, have done a lot of work on trying to use Go workspaces recently. Uh, and yes, there is a lot of feedback that gets fed back to the, to the Go team in that regard. And uh, historically, they, I, the, the, the relationship is healthier than ever. How about that? <laughs> Daniel, do you want to? Should we do Daniel and then David? Thanks. Um, so I imagine a scenario where let's say there are uh, 10 providers uh, and one component, right? And, and so you, a change to the component manifest gets tested against these 10 providers. And let's say today one or two providers run the test and or how you know however that that works and w one, one of those tests fails is the burden on that provider or on the component now let's say then a week later uh all 10 of the providers have run the test and now it's failing for eight out of the 10 of them now is the you know that question of the burden where yeah do you have any thoughts on that uh, yeah i mean i'm i think the 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 tests that run in, in the provider, in the components repos, uh, we would expect for them to run on every PR. And if there's a breakage there, that's where we'd expect the, the component to, to pick up on that. Um, I feel like if we, if we somehow see that something then fails in KOps when we pu pull the latest version, you know, we, we'll probably look at what's going on there first because our assumption will be that it's our fault somehow. Um, I think, We'll see what happens going forwards. I, there's at least some expectation that now that uh, the the code, the, the manifest that we're getting has worked at some stage, and we can now go back and look at those tests 
And having those two uh, test results and the history of those test results will enable us to hopefully like get some idea of where that problem may, may lie. Um, but yeah, we will, we'll figure it out sort of as we go. Um, yeah, Maybe David, please. Thank you. And then... uh, a similar vein, slightly more pointed. Uh, uh -oh. so, so I'm now a component, I support 10 different platforms, and I'm trying to do the most good for the most people. Uh, and one out of the 10 fails. Do you believe this should prevent a repo from saying, yeah, I'm real sorry, you're broken, but this is an important fix for the other nine? Uh, and as you know, someone with a distro, we face the issue. Honestly, I think that should be up to you. I think, I think when you take those, uh, you, you're not obliged to accept the 10 E to E tests. Um, I think it, it helps you to have more E to E tests. And I think if you want to say, yes, we don't care about Google, then that's up to you, right? And I, I, think it's, I think it's a fair statement. Anyone should be allowed to make that statement and say that and make that choice. And you know, we're certainly not gonna stand in the way of, of that. I think one of the things that has happened today is that those statements are not explicit, right? Um, so at least now we'll be able to say, yeah, we are deliberately doing this rather than I've accidentally broken like this thing over here and I have no idea really until six months later when you're like, oh yeah, I forgot about that entirely, which is sort of where we are today. Um, so I, I think we're in a better place. I don't wanna, I don't think anyone in this room wants to centralize and say thou shalt not break, you know, other people. But uh, I, I think if, uh, I'm trying to think of any, any good examples, if, if we had a secrets operator, right, that was maintained by Google and somehow it was breaking a lot on Azure, for example, right? Presumably some pointed questions, even more pointed questions would be asked at that time. Uh, but I, you know, I think we are, as you say, all trying to do the best we can. And that, to date, that sort of uh, behavior has not arisen. So we're, we're, in, we're hopefully okay if, we, if we're able to make the choices deliberately, I think. Thanks, so. so, Was there one more question there? And then and maybe, that's maybe the last one. <clears throat> Um, this this work on removing the like the cloud providers code from the repo, I think it can be seen like a major paradigm shift cleanup in the in the in the repo. So I'm curious, can you can you think of any other like major cleanup efforts that's going on right now that is kind of like worthy of uh, to take a look or maybe even contribute uh, to? David, you want to? I mean, I, I feel like a lot of it has happened, but. You know. We've had a lot of cleanup in a lot of spaces. I think if I were looking at like, what is this closest to? Um, I would see this as comparable to the effort like when we introduced RBAC. We went everywhere and updated everyone and like Jordan did half of them, half of them by himself, right? And it was a lot of work. I think we're gonna face something similar when we do cell admission, where it's gonna be, we wanna replace these webhooks. Someone has to do all the work. Uh, so it's not the first time we've had something like this. This is one of the most costly, though, uh, but it would have a huge benefit. Um, this would be awesome. Yeah, another one might be that there's going to be, I think, more around uh, maybe pulling some more stuff out of staging. I think like some of the work going into workspaces is is maybe going to enable that, uh, and so like maybe we'll split kube cuddle out. You know, it's it's uh, I don't know. We'll see. <laughs> I am not saying I'm not volunteering, nor am I volunteering anyone to do that work. But you know, I think there will be we're certainly unblocking a bunch of these things. And, and the cell work is, as David says, super exciting. I would like to so. add, like we are removing entry volume plugins in favor of CSI. It was a huge effort on storage side. Here we are. Storage volumes for next next. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>